Thank you very much, Liz, um, and welcome everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic privilege to be able to talk to you about this site uh, this evening. Um, I guess uh, in your part of the world, you're fairly used to, to exciting Roman remains, but um, it's, it's an interesting thing in, in our part of the world. Um, we, we don't do an awful lot of um, Roman rural archaeology. It doesn't often pop up, um, which as you um, just heard, it's, it's, it's kind of news to my ears because I'm more interested in the Iron Age really. Um, but um, I have a, a passing interest in the Roman period and, um, and this site, being involved in this site has been an absolute dream come true really in, in, in many respects. Now, um, there are many kind of advantages and privileges of, to, to the work that I do as an archeologist. A um, couple of them spring to mind in terms of what we're going to talk about this evening. Um, I, I really like the aspect of, of communicating the results of, of the work that we do in, in, in situations such as this, in um, publishing the results in a, in a variety of formats. And um, I think part of the um, role of an archeologist is to tell stories to engage people about the past. Um, this project in particular is, is full of stories. Um, there's the, the story of the discovery, the story of the actual archaeological site itself. And the central thing that we're going to talk about this evening and the, and the most eye-catching part of the project so far, uh, and, and has certainly captured the public imagination with all the press releases and everything, is the story of the mosaic itself and what that is telling us. Um, the other aspects that I really, really like, and, and I'm sure many of you will, will, will be able to to, to, to um, sort of agree with this is that archaeology is something you can never get bored with. There's always something new to learn. And, and, and in many respects, that um, this project fits that bill as well. Um, I must admit, um, rather to my shame, that uh, I've, I've had a copy of um, the Iliad, which this um, mosaic talks about, um, on my shelf for quite a few years and so it's been remained unread but I'm, I can assure you I've had a go at reading the, the um, certainly the passages that refer to this mosaic now and uh, in fact um, I, I did delve into the, the recent retelling of that story by um, Stephen Fry as well which kind of highlights the fact that this is a story that has been developing for a very long time and still being um, developed and, and engaging people um, as we as we as we speak, really. So let's see if we can get this going. Trying to move it on. Hang on. Try this way. Okay. So our story begins, and now some of you hopefully will recognise this as the opening scenes from Gladiator. Uh, it begins in a wheat field. It's not the, the wheat field shown in here, which I believe is kind of the Elysian field, so um, gladiator going into the afterlife. It's a, a, a field in rural Rutland. And our hero isn't Russell Crowe, but it's um, a man called Jim Irvine, who's a local um, resident in, in, in Rutland. He's the son of um, a landowner. And it was on his land, his father's land, that him and his family were walking um, during the first coronavirus lockdown in 2020. Now this is an, uh, he's not a farmer, but he's helped his family for um, a number of years since he was a teenager. He knows the, well, he thought he knew the land inside out, like the back of his hand. Um, but on this particular instance, he had to make a diversion around the field in a different way because there was a, um, some angry bees that were threatening him and his family. So he made a detour and went into an area where the, um, the crop hadn't been growing quite so well. Uh, and, and as he was walking through the field, he began to find bits of pottery, bits of tile and oyster shells all in quite a concentration. Um, and these are things that he'd not really seen before in the field. And he thought, OK, this is quite interesting. Um, this is obviously something unusual. He's, a, he's a, um, an interested person in archaeology and history, sort of clicked some, um, rang some bells with him in his mind. And um, he decided to do a bit more research. He went and had a look at the, um, the field on um, Google Maps. And this is the aerial view of that area. And you can see the bit that's circled with uh, the, the, the red outline. 
um, within that is this really fantastic crop mark. Um, if I show you the um, black and white version of that image, you can see it stands out extremely clearly. Um, it looks very much like there's some sort of building in there. Um, but there's also these very dark marks as well, perhaps hinting at ditches. Um, there are some big sweeping ditches coming down here too. Uh, there seems to be quite a lot going on. But the, the, the area that caught Jim's eye mostly was, was this area here. He could sort of see potentially this is a building. He didn't quite know what the age might be. He was looking at it with the, the sort of rounded end here and wondering whether or not it might be a, a sort of early church or a chapel. But his inquisitiveness got um, the better of him and uh, he decided to investigate. He, like I said, he knows this area very, very well. And looking at the Google Earth um, image, he was able to work out more or less exactly where this was in the field. So one afternoon with the aid of his father, here's Jim on the left, there's his father, Brian. They went to investigate and uh, his initial intention had been to um, dig down and see if he could find um, a hint of a wall to, to confirm his suspicions that this was a building. What he actually did was come down on the inside of one of the walls and he came down onto something very hard. And when he excavate, uh, excavated, he found the remains of a tessellated pavement. At this point, potentially, I suppose you could argue he could have stopped. Um, and if he had done and contacted the, um, the, 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 H, the local HER, the, the, the record of all the archaeological and historical sites in the county, we would have had a record of a crop mark and with a, with a, um, a tessellated pavement. And the conclusion probably would have been it's a Roman villa and that would have been the record. However, his, um, because this, this, obviously this site is, is an agricultural field, it's not under any kind of threat from development. I, I guess everything would have stopped at that point. However, his inquisitiveness um, deepened and he thought, okay, what is this? I don't think he really recognized what he'd got. Um, so he put his shovel aside and enlisted the help of a slightly bigger implement <laughs> to, um, to investigate further. And um, they own a little mini digger and um, he came along another afternoon and, and dug a bit further. And you can see just how far they went um, in this image down on the right. And thankfully for everybody, um, Jim was sensible enough to, to sort of think, hang on a minute, this is getting a bit beyond what I can deal with. And, 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 and perhaps I should really get in touch with people now to get some help. Um, and it was at this point really when we became involved um, he got in touch with the um, local planning archaeologist, Richard Clark, who we work with um, very, uh, very closely as part of our normal work with development um, funded work. And, uh, and he got in touch with, with me one afternoon when I was working at home during COVID lockdown and, uh, and said, OK, um, would you be able to send some people out to help um, a local landowner in Rutland has, has uncovered a mosaic and I said okay this, this isn't an unusual kind of occurrence um, and we often try to lend a hand where we can. Um, he went on to say this is perhaps not quite the usual <laughs> kind of mosaic. He said um, there are horses on it, there appear to be chariots and there are figures and I was like oh okay this seems very unusual. Um, Quite a lot of the mosaics that we've come across in the past, and there aren't that many really in terms of um, this is my experience, but there are quite a lot known in Leicestershire and Rutland, but a lot of those are antiquarian discoveries. Um, and of the ones that we've seen more recently, they're mostly decorative rather than um, figurative, but certainly having this combination of figures and, uh, and uh, other characters on, the, on this mosaic seemed highly unusual. So we were very keen to get involved. Um, at this point also, Richard Clark had been in, in, in touch with Historic England, who were now starting to think this could be something pretty special. Um, and so we were initially enlisted to, oh, this is, this is us seeing the, uh, the discovery from, from, for the first time. Um, and then here's myself and uh, Jennifer Browning, who's my um, 
ULAS colleague who ran the excavations on site, uh, Peter Liddell, who's um, uh, a former planning archaeologist, but also uh, the, the main lead for all of the community work that goes on in, in the county, and, and Jim. And so we're, we're busy gawping at, at, at what's been uncovered so far. Um, and I think Jim's thinking, what have I done? <laughs> so initially, we were engaged to come and help record what had been uncovered by Jim in his trench, uh, clean everything up, and try and get a better picture of what we were seeing in this mosaic. And also to look at the overlying layers that you can see behind uh, Debbie here, who is one of our excavation team, and all of the layers here that Jim had removed, not knowing, of course, that this was archaeology too. So we, we needed to still see what the potential was for these layers that could potentially sort of tell us an awful lot about what happened after the building went out of use but also have a look at this mosaic and see exactly what we were looking at here. And so as, as we went on, um, cleaning the mosaic to bring out the colours, to, to get this you know, better idea of what we were seeing uh, as part of this. We had this amazing experience of literally coming face to face with the, fact that the past as these figures um, came to light. And gradually more of the pattern and the decoration became apparent. And, uh, and we also engaged the services of David Neal, who's seen in the blue shirt here. He's, uh, some of you may know of, of David or heard of him. He is the foremost um, expert in Roman mosaics in the country. He's, he's seen and recorded virtually all of them. Um, so he's the go-to man when, when you come across a mosaic like this. Uh, and his techniques, he's a watercolor artist as well. His techniques are to, um, he basically comes along and does a scale drawing, uh, a scale plan of the, the mosaic, and then he takes them back to his studio and, uh, and, and fills, fills them in with watercolours, tesserae by tesserae. And I think his um, estimate for eventually what we've, we've got, what he's recording now is somewhere between 20 and 30,000 individual tesserae that he's got to paint, which is quite mind boggling really. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that he's uh, still got his, all of his marbles, really. <laughs> it, it sort of makes me shudder to think about doing that, but he is fantastic and will produce this really good interpretive model. Um, so as, as well as um, understanding quite what we had in this particular part of the site, um, Historic England were by now thinking this is probably a site that we want to protect uh, to, to, to become a scheduled monument. So we were tasked with doing um, some peripheral work um, to, to determine what the effects of ploughing was going to be or, or was happening on the site. Uh, but also we were also, um, a, a, we had to engage a geophysical survey team to understand the bigger context, the wider context of what was going on here. So we in, engaged with um, John Gator's company, Sumo um, Survey Limited, which John Gator is the person who does all of the survey for time team. Some of you will know him. And we use their um, company quite a lot, generally speaking. So we know they're really good. Uh, and they did they carried out two survey techniques. This is um, the result of magnetometry. And that basically is really good at looking at um, the below ground archaeology. The, um, the sort of the cut features and the deeper features. And what you can see here is a, is a much more detailed version of what you could see on the crop marks, what you could get a hint of on the crop marks, all these fantastic sweeping ditches down here. I should say that down here, you can see um, there's a river that forms the sort of southern boundary of the, the, the site and it's on sloping ground going down towards that river. And maybe these ditches are sort of echoing that um, course of the river for whatever reason. Um, but there are also these wonderful multi-ditched angular features which form a, a nice, ro very Roman looking enclosure around um, this area of disturbance here, which you can see, which on the magnetometry isn't very clear. Um, but the other uh, um, technique that we use is ground penetrating radar and, uh, and even Sumo and John Gator were absolutely staggered with the detail that we were able to get from that survey. It seemed to be a particularly good site 
to get those details out. So we're faced now with a whole range of different buildings um, which form what we now know to be a brand new Roman villa complex in our area. So this is the building that was um, identified on, on the crop marks. And you can see the, the uh, additional building here, the annex and the, the um, well, the upside ap end as we now know it, and the twin upside end at this side. Um, but, you know, going beyond the, um, the crop mark evidence, you can see clearly that there's a whole range of other different buildings um, going on. And if you put the two surveys together, oops, sorry, I'm skipping ahead there. So this is the main um, villa building as we, as we know it at the moment from the work that we've done. There's a whole range of different other buildings. This may, you can sort of see that the, you can even see the subdivisions within this. Um, so all, all the individual rooms, this may have been potentially another domestic structure, but there's also perhaps barns, um, a little um, bathhouse maybe, or um, perhaps a little chapel structure even, sitting out there on the western edge. This one down here seems to be uh, a, a sort of developed aisled barn, so you can just about, these dots are where um, pillars would have been, so the footings for great big posts, um, perhaps similar to this one up here. But this seems to have been encapsulated by proper walls in this version, and potentially there's subdivisions that you can see as well. So quite possibly this one could have become a domestic structure in its later, later usage. Other great big buildings over here, and again, this one here, which seems to be a, another aisle barn. You can see they're kind of arranged around this open courtyard, but it's a loose arrangement of, um, of structures that may or may not be all broadly contemporary. There may be different phases. And if you put them all together, you can see that's what we have there. And you can see that they're, they're kind of, all of these buildings are arranged quite neatly within this um, angular um, sort of arrangement of these ditches and the possible outlier over here. So a fantastic new addition to what we know about um, Roman rural Rutland and Leicestershire, because this is a um, brand new Roman villa that we've, we would never have known about before, um, before Jim looked, started looking. And it's actually from the work we've been able to do already, this is um, looking to be one of the best uh, examples um, in terms of a, a ground plan that we have from the county. So already this is a, a significant addition to what we know already. The, um, the excavation work that we've done so far suggests that it's a uh, third or fourth century in date, so quite a late, a late addition. Some of them that we have in the county are slightly earlier, um, second or third century, or some of them even seem to develop from important Iron Age centres. But this one seems so far to be a late addition to that, to that suite of um, Roman villas that we have. In the, in the county. There are about 63 known already from, from our area. Only about a third of those have seen any kind of excavation and, um, and even less of them have had proper publications because of the nature of the work. Uh, a lot of them were done in the 19th century uh, and they were quite sort of targeted. People seem to get the understanding that these places had uh, the potential to get mosaics. So we do know quite a bit about mosaics from these sites, but not a lot else. Uh, and I'd say a lot of them were antiquarian excavations and, um, and the detail of those excavations isn't really uh, up to the modern standard. So this site in particular, with it being so complete, offers a very good research potential for um, understanding these villas. And so all of that indication um, and the work that we did to work out how denuded the archeology span was being, being done by the plowing uh, led in historic England to um, arrive at a, the conclusion that this site needed scheduling. So that has had now happened um, and that took place in November last year, which is when we were able to um, promote the site with the um, uh, press release that we did uh, once that was all safe and secure. So that is now protected. And the farmer has now um, been told that he can no longer um, plough the land. They've got to take it back to pasture. So some quite significant changes that they've had to contend with. So another 
consequence of lockdown um, was that we, uh, our students at the university had quite a backlog of um, field work that they needed to catch up on to complete their degrees. And so this presented an ideal opportunity to, to, to engage them with the site and learn a little bit more about it. Um, from what we'd seen of the mosaic in the previous year, we had an idea that this was telling a story and we had an idea what that story might be. And one of the central characters in that story was the Greek hero Achilles, if our interpretation was correct. But it seemed strange to us to um, then sort of go to the wider public with this story without being able to show the main character. So we approached in Historic England um, with the backing of David Neal to say, actually, this is a, a hugely significant, potentially a hugely significant piece of um, Roman art that really needs to be seen in its full to um, get the full research potential. But at the same time, we could use the um, uh, to take advantage of this situation with the students to try and look at different areas of the, um, the, the, the villa itself. And they agreed to it, thankfully. So we in um, September last year, we went through with uh, some extra excavation. And these are areas we wanted to look at. So, and I will go through these um, one by one. So we wanted to look at uh, the area, a wider area of um, the area where we found the mosaic. Uh, a little look at this area to the side to see how that connected to the main villa. Uh, and another area over here um, to sample some of the other buildings here. But I didn't say in, um, it's not completely clear on the geophysical plot. There are some unusual circular structures over here. So we wanted to look at what they might be. And that's where we started. So the circular building trench um, the aim was to um, look at that in a bit more detail and try and find out what um, what those um, structures might be, how what date they were, whether or not they were a significantly um, different date to to where we'd looked at before, and also to work out what might be happening with um, other features in the near vicinity. What we came down onto was the foundations of, we uncovered about half of the um, uh, foundations of the circular stone building, uh, about eight, nearly nine metres in diameter, sort of roundhouse sized really. And that may be what this is, a sort of echo of previous architecture, um, you know, previous architectural traditions, but in stone. And you can see that it was um, constructed of different um, styles of stonework so the main walls were constructed of the sort of layered stone but on the inside um, perhaps potentially supporting um, uh, a sort of um, internal um, bench or, or some other arrangement this kind of pitch stone herringbone type um, foundation there wasn't a great deal left of it unfortunately um, but it does appear to have had a, an association with a, a rec rectangular building that's kind of shooting off northwards. Um, we're not quite sure whether these uh, structures coexisted as a sort of keyhole shaped building, which would be pretty unusual, or whether one replaced the other. But um, I must also stress um, that a lot of this work is still pending further research. So this is, these are very much interim statements that I'm going to talk about really, for, certainly for these kind of trenches. Um, but what we did get is that there was an awful lot of um, sort of evidence for lots and lots of activity, lots of pottery, lots of bone, lots of domestic activity evidence, um, really burnt and ashy soils, which when we compare them with the um, evidence that we got from where the mosaic is and the building associated with it to the, to the east, um, which were very clean in terms of fines. Um, this does seem to be very much the kind of business end, um, potentially, of where, where people were, were working. And um, that, this may be related to the, the, the sort of general day-to-day -day workings of the villa rather than the kind of high society um, domestic activity that was going on potentially other way, in, in, in other areas. So the Northern Annex Trench, this is a very um, interesting one in terms of the, the contrast. So this was an interesting building. We weren't quite sure how it connected to the main villa building. Um, potentially, we thought it could be a sort of annex um, 
perhaps a guest house um, area, that kind of thing. It's a bit of an unusual arrangement. Um, and again, we wanted to look at dates and, uh, and try and work out what uh, might be going on in this area too. Um, we got a fairly enigmatic answer, unfortunately, um, but in very, very interesting in terms of contrast. Um, the, um, as I said, this was um, very clean in terms of fines. What we did find was that um, this was a, a, a fairly simple structure, I guess you could say. Um, you can see the red outline here. This is where the um, main outline of the building was. So the, we've got some very nice walls and we could see that at a later date, some of this had been subdivided to create different rooms. We don't really know what the function of these, these rooms could have been, but it also seems very plain. There wasn't any kind of um, um, ostentatious um, decoration as we've seen in the, um, as we'll see in a minute from the, 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 the main uh, mosaic room. No evidence of any interesting floors or painted wall plaster, very little occupational material. So a little bit of an unusual one, really. Um, as I say, we're still very much in the um, formative stages of working out what that might be. There was a little square structure attached to the northern annex. And initially, when we looked at the geophysics, we think we thought perhaps this was a, a stoke hole for underfloor heating, but it just seems to be a freestanding square structure. Um, again, pretty enigmatic. Um, but one of the interesting things that we did find was that um, there was a, an, a Roman infant burial aligned with that just to the outside of it. And they're not unusual occurrences to find on Roman rural sites. Um, and that, you know, potentially gives us clues as to some of the other activities that are going on in the area. So the mosaic trench, uh, we wanted to look at this wider area to try and encapsulate the whole room, really, uh, that we could identify in the geophys. And by way of doing that, um, have a look at um, the structure of the, the room, try and work out what it might be. And of course, excavate the rest of the mosaic and see what we had there. So we learned a little bit more about the architecture of the room. In the apse, we found um, remains of these little pedestals from which um, pillars would have been um, springing from. And it perhaps gives us an idea that the, um, there was a vaulted ceiling, certainly over the apse, um, which was polygonal in, uh, in plan, you can see from here. Um, so potentially giving us an idea of that, that roof support over the apse, some re really interesting architectural evidence. We found large evidence of local um, roof slates, some with nails, lots and lots of nails. So you're getting the impression of perhaps this building collapsing over time and, uh, and, and giving us some really important information about how this building could have looked when it was in use. Um, so just looking around the edges of the, um, the room as well, we were able to get some little insights into what might be going on in other areas. So there's another tessellated floor just to the south of it, potentially a corridor, potentially another room. Um, we've got evidence of a very interesting decorative mosaic just going off to the um, east. And that's also in the corridor, what appears to be a corridor, but could also be something that has been uh, made into another room. We are coming back this year to investigate this further because you can see we've only just got a little bit of it. But apparently the, um, the decoration on this is, is highly unusual. And David Neal has suggested that the, there aren't that many parallels for this kind of pattern in, in the UK, um, but um, there are plenty of parallels in the Middle East, uh, sort of uh, Eastern Europe, beg your pardon. So, um, so potentially, this is another unusual clue as to, as to, as to you know, what, what might be the influences for the mosaics that we're finding in this area. Uh, we also un investigated uh, or uncovered evidence for an underfloor heating system. And this is an example of such from Chedworth Roman Villa. And this is what we found uh, in, on, on the site uh, in Rutland. It's a similar kind of um, circumstances going on there. Um, now this had um, sort of unfortunately collapsed under the weight of the rubble that was overlying it, 
Um, so it's taken um, the remains of another mosaic that must have been covering it down into the channel. Um, so we've got a bit of a jigsaw puzzle to, to work out there. So I can't unfortunately show you that, but it does appear to be another patterned mosaic um, going through that corridor. So you can get the impression of quite an impressive end to that particular part of the building uh, in terms of the, um, the decoration that was going on and the sort of status that this building must have had. And all of these mosaics are of a, um, a, a quite a high quality, suggestive of um, a very um, expensive um, layout to, to get them in. So very high status display of wealth um, that, that's been portrayed here. So onto the main aspect of, of, of the work that we returned to. Um, we spent um, quite some time peeling back the layers to try and complete the picture of the mosaic. So this is where we started from and we cleaned up the, the sand which we'd covered over so that we knew where to get to, uh, where to start when we, uh, when we returned. And gradually, inch by inch, we sort of made our way over to areas that we hadn't seen before until eventually all of these details were revealed and the room itself um, was more understandable. So what we have here is um, what we think is uh, a, a room in a villa called a triclinium. And this is otherwise known as a, an entertaining or dining area. Um, the, um, I've, I've, I've got it set up here um, in the way that the, um, the mosaic um, can be seen, but it's, you, you, you can appreciate that it's, uh, this is the orientation of the building on the, on the ground, but it's easier to show it you the right way up in terms of how it should be viewed. So the idea with a triclinium is that um, the, the guests and um, uh, or the main guests really would sit in the apse, uh, viewing, looking out, viewing this wonderful mosaic. And there are plenty of examples of, of these. I'll show you a couple later on from other Roman villas. So we know how they, 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 they're intended to be operated. Um, so in the area where the guests would have been sat, um, it, it's quite plain, tesserae. Um, the rest of the floor is divided up into um, four blocks. And you can see from this, this area here has a, um, a, 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 a what's known as a sort of guilloche mat. And the guilloche is this fantastic sort of twisted cord decoration here, which uh, sort of becomes the border of all of the imagery along here. Um, and that's set into sort of two squares. And you can see that there's an awful lot of damage um, that's taken place um, later on. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, but, but thankfully enough survived for us to be able to, to work out what was going on in the mosaic. Um, unfortunately, in this instance, we did get the impression that there was potentially a figure uh, in this area. We have no idea who this could have been, but there was just the very glimpse of someone's elbow in the area that survived. So quite frustrating, really. Um, but, you know, we, we have to be thankful for, for what survived, really. But then the remainder of, of what can be seen is this fantastic um, mosaic which is incredibly rare, not only in its um, subject matter, but in the way it's um, portrayed. It's very much um, laid out in a comic book fashion with the story being told over three panels um, in much similar way to classic comics of old and my old favorite, Banana Man, if anybody's familiar with Banana Man. Um, now, it's, it's the same effect really, telling a story visually in panels to get the point across fairly simply. Now, back in the Roman period, um, they didn't have the benefits of Banana Man, but what they did have are these wonderful stories that they would have told. Now, this is just to um, give you the, the, the idea of how the Triclinium would have worked. This is Lullingstone, Roman Villa in Kent. And there's one view here um, with the people sat in the apse looking out over this fantastic mosaic that they had there, which is largely um, decorative, but does have um, figures associated with um, Greek mythology as well. And it's broadly contemporary, the one that we have. And you can see here the effect from the apse with the owner telling the story 
and, uh, and, and, and showing off potentially um, that they've got this wonderful mosaic, but perhaps educating people as well and their, their friends and colleagues in, in what these stories might be. So the, uh, the, what we have here, and it, it, it sort of uh, confirmed our suspicions really, this is um, a version of the end of the Iliad as, as shown um, by, as, as narrated by Homer, um, when he wrote it down in uh, sort of 800 BC, but already by then it probably was quite an, uh, an old story. The lead up to the story is that the, the Greek hero Achilles had actually taken his, um, taken leave of the battle at this point. He'd, um, and um, by doing so, he, you know, caused quite a demoralizing effect to the Greek army. So they weren't having the, the desired effect that they wanted to in their siege of the city of Troy. Now, Greek, uh, um, Achilles' best friend, um, Patroclus, who was also potentially his, his lover, um, decided he wanted to rally the troops and he wore um, Achilles' armour and went into battle pretending to be him to try and um, encourage everybody back into the battle. This did have the desired effect, but unfortunately um, he was killed by the um, Trojan hero, Prince Hector. And of course, this then led to the fact to, to Achilles returning to the battle because he was so enraged at the, um, the death of his, his, his um, former friend and compatriot. So this is the first scene then. So he becomes so outraged by what has happened that he, he challenges Hector to a duel. Um, and here they are facing off in, in these wonderful chariots. So here's Achilles on the left-hand side. Thankfully, you can see that the damage didn't quite obscure his face, so we can see him. He does, does actually exist. This is all stuff that we couldn't see in the first year that we, we, we looked at the mosaic. And uh, he's seen, you can see he's seen in much bigger scale and he's uh, sort of shown heroically nude as they, they would have done in those days to, to, to emphasize his superpowers really. And he's been, he's in his fantastically decorated chariot. Um, he's pointing a, a spear across here. You can see the, the spearhead there. And his chariot's being pulled by these light and dark horses, which are, we think are meant to represent Achilles' horse, horses. Um, Xanthos and Balius. On the right hand side is his opponent, Prince Hector. Unfortunately, we can't see his face, but you know, he's got his back to us. He's got this fantastic tunic. Again, he's in this really wonderful chariot. He's got a spear facing there. And the whole scene is very dynamic and kinetic. You can see that they're, they're, they're bursting from the borders. There's even potentially, if we go back to this idea of the sort of cartoon element of it, this idea of a sort of movement underneath the horses here. I think that's really kind of trying to emphasize that, that movement of these characters. Um, now, sadly for Hector, the, um, the end result doesn't work out very well for him. Achilles kills him in this duel, but he's so enraged by everything that's happened. He just won't give up with his thirst for revenge. Now, the, the moral code of the time would have been that he should have given his body over back to the family so that they could bury this person and, and grieve for them. But Achilles is not interested in that. And he straps poor Hector to the back of his chariot and he drives him round and round and round the city of Troy for about a week, as it's told, constantly trying to pummel the body even further. And who we see here on the, the right hand side is, is Hector's father, King Priam of Troy. And he's got this wonderful um, stripy robe. He's wearing a, a red Phrygian cap, which um, is a way that the Romans had of identifying um, Trojans. And you can see his bare foot. He's not got anything on his feet. Uh, and he looks like he's pleading. He's, it's clearly he's been caught unaware of what's going on. He's, he's absolutely astonished by what Achilles is doing. He's pleading for the return of his son's body. We don't know who this character is, but he's clearly on Achilles' side. He just seems to be fairly happy with what's going on. There are some characters in the scenes that we really can't identify. <clears throat> and the other interesting aspect of this, and you can just about see down in the bottom here, 
this strange, you can just about see tail and, uh, and a face popping up here. This is a um, sea, mythical sea creature known as a Pistrix. We don't quite know why that's there, but we do know that the, um, all of this activity is taking place near the sea. And we also know that there's a river, the river Scamander is actually a character in the story as well. And it may be that this, this um, creature is there to um, indicate that they're by the sea or by the river. I'm sure there's a lot of imagery in these scenes that we really can't get to the bottom of because just because they would have meant something to all the people that looked at it, but we really can't get into that level of detail. Now the final and perhaps the cruelest scene of all in this story is that um, eventually Achilles decides to release Hector's body, but um, only for his weight in gold. And this is an interesting kind of departure from the Homer version of this, because in the Homer version, when um, before Hector dies, Achilles says, you're never going back to your family, even for your weight in gold. And it's a kind of throwaway cruel line that um, Achilles says, but we know that um, there's a later playwright called Aeschylus, who was writing a few hundred years after Homer, and he adapted this um, story for the, the stage. And we know that from the fragments that remain that he had incorporated this kind of version um, for dramatic effect on the stage. So what we might be looking at here is either um, a, a, a version of events that this villa owner knew um, by way of um, the story being handed down to them uh, and it being slightly distorted along the way, or it might be that they didn't really know about the Homer version and all they knew was the Aeschylus version or another version of that story. Um, so what you can see here is this fantastic uh, sort of Trojan servant or retainer. He's got this huge pair of weighing scales on, across his shoulders with Hector on one side uh, and this great big pan um, on the other side. And, and you can see King Priam here loading gold vessels on, onto that to, to, to weigh um, Hector's body and balance that out. Again, there's characters that we don't really know who they are. There's this kind of shield bearer here. We don't know who that person might be. And unfortunately, there's a lot of burning on this side. We know that Achilles is in here somewhere, um, but there also appears to be other characters too. We've done a little bit of work on that. And what we might be looking at here is that Achilles is on a throne, seated there, holding a spear, um, observing the events that are going on with two people behind his, his, his throne here. Um, we don't really know who they might be. <clears throat> now, before we um, uncovered this mosaic, the only other known uh, mosaic from the, from the country that was had a, a narrative theme was this one from the Loham mosaic in, in um, Somerset. Uh, and this was discovered in the 1930s. Uh, and it shows scenes from um, the, um, Virgil's Aeneid, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, that, that, that follows on really from, from the um, story of the Iliad. It's a, sort of after the, the, the Troy has fallen and um, this is the story of um, Aeneas um, sort of fleeing to, to a new land and setting up um, his life there. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but um, it's just to show you um, the other, the only other version really of um, a, 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 a narrative, narrative narrative uh, mosaic that we have in the country. Um, this is a slightly unusual one, but you can see that the, the story is told in panels in a similar way. I think potentially ours is a, a little bit more straightforward to understand, um, but, but um, you can tell just from this that um, the rarity of that is, um, is quite stark in terms of what we know about it. And just to show you some of the other um, relatively um, comparable mosaics from around this time. There seems to be quite a flurry of activity in the late Roman period that um, is related to classical literature and, uh, and, and mythology. This one here, it was excavated relatively recently in, in Berkshire, the Boxford mosaic, to my eyes is a little bit garish um, in the comparison to ours. There's an awful lot going on and it's not particularly brilliant quality, but Nonetheless, it does give us a great um, comparison in terms of 
these mythological scenes and um, this one crams an awful lot in. But the interesting thing about this is that there are um, certain, you know, it tells an awful, it's trying to tell an awful lot of stories. But the interesting thing about this is there are little clues as to what's going on for the for the viewer. Um, so um, even if they have half an idea of what they might be seeing, they're, they're being led along um, by, by these inscriptions as to what they might be looking at. Whereas the what our one doesn't have any inscriptions at all. So it kind of implies potentially that there is that there ought to be some knowledge um, from the viewer as to what they're seeing, which might lead us to the to to, to sort of think about what that might be telling us about the level of education of society um, in those days that we might not necessarily get an insight into. But it might also be, um, you know, a way of pr placing more emphasis on the um, on the narrator uh, or the villa owner and putting more importance on what they can tell their, their, their friends and colleagues. And there's a, uh, a sort of reconstructed version of that. So you can see all of the different characters and the stories that that's trying to tell, but also these uh, these little inscriptions to give the, the viewer clues. Now, the, another one that's caught my eye, not necessarily for the, um, the, the, the content, but certainly the, 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 the sort of um, horses and chariots. This one famously in Lincolnshire has um, a chariot race scene on it. And I just wanted to sort of show you this one um, it caught my eye, not only because of the sort of slightly different um, level of detail, perhaps, that's been executed here, but um, the fact that these are very much kind of functional utilitarian um, chariots in this kind of sport um, context, if you like, uh, in, in comparison to the very highly decorated ones that we saw on the Rutland mosaic for these very kind of regal princely characters. That we're dealing with in the story. Now, this is the the the, the, the Rutland mosaic is the only um, example in this country, and one of only a, a very full, a few um, examples across the whole of the the Roman Empire, really, that show this these scenes and this story. We have to go slightly further afield to Italy to see anything near comparable, um, and you can see that this is. Um, Something again from uh, a dining room. You can see the apse and the uh, the large central area there. But this is very much more damaged than the um, the mosaic that we found. So, um, but tellingly, um, the, the the one survival is um, this weighing scene again, which is interesting because it does kind of indicate that this version of events was more widely available than than perhaps we might have thought. Um, the interesting. Um, point um, to make out here is that again we have these inscriptions um, which tell us who these characters are so Achilles has this kind of extravagantly plumed helmet in the center um, we have um, Odysseus on one side and Diomedes on the other who we know are from the um, Iliad are um, um, friends and uh, comrades with um, Achilles as part of the Greek army. And it might be that these are the people that we're seeing on the Rutland Villa as well. What you can see also here is the, the weighing scales that, have, that are set up. You can see the pan full of objects. You can just about get the hint of poor Hector's feet poking in. And, uh, and we, we it's generally um, assume that this is um, King Priam's hand poking in saying, look, I think we've got the balance here. Can I have my son back? These scenes um, are fairly common on other as or other aspects of the, this story are fairly common on other objects. Um, they're seen singly in um, on other mosaics. This is the dragging of Hector from a, um, a mosaic in Rome. You get this scene repeated quite a lot on um, Roman sarcophagi on um, vessels, Greek and Roman vessels, um, but it's highly unusual to find them on, um, on, on mosaics. And here you can see different versions of the weighing scene. Here's one with on a sarcophagus with um, Hector lying on, on one side of the, the scales. <clears throat> in this one here, the, mos the, the scales are kind of set up in, in, in the background and, and Hector's body's on the floor. 
are waiting to be um, to be weighed or, or balanced out. And then this version down here, Hector is being taken over to the scale. So you can see there's, there's very much an indication that uh, this version of events was was was, was popular and, and around, but uh, only um, only only very rarely depicted in, in ancient uh, objects. So I mentioned before um, what um, those layers indicated from uh, that, that, that we went to record. And I, I'm of the opinion that these are just as important as, as revealing the mosaic, because this really does give us a great picture of um, what was going on in those, in those post-Roman times and when these um, buildings went out of use that would have been really expensive, important buildings in their heyday, but seem to have gone drifting out of use as, as the, um, the Roman um, occupation sort of went into decline. Um, and so this particular site offers a great opportunity to, to, to get an understanding of that. As I mentioned, the, um, the room itself, we were fantastically lucky to get the survival that we did with the, with the mosaic, but it was pockmarked with a lot of burning, lots of disturbance and what we found was that uh, at some point in its life when presumably the building was still operational there was a big um, circular fireplace inserted into the corner of that room overlying the mosaic in that corner and that's what um, created that, that spread of burning that sort of obliterated um, or obscured the, the picture of um, Achilles in his throne with his companions in that corner of the mosaic. Um, and that then led on to a whole series of different halves across the room, but also within the layers that overlay the, um, the, the floor itself. Over time, rubble and dirt and silt built up, but it seemed that people were still coming back and using this, this space, which suggests that there was certainly some kind of evidence of that building um, still above the ground. It, it wasn't something that had been reduced or deliberately demolished. It had been sort of left to, to, to go into gradual decline, I, I guess. Um, as I said, there was evidence of, of robbing of some of the walls, um, some of the um, areas around in the other area, in the other bits of space had kind of collapsed. And these are some of the bits of um, mosaic that I mentioned that were collapsed through um, into the um, into the um, hypercoursed area uh, to the to the west. Also bits of painted wall plaster that perhaps would have adorned the buildings, uh, sorry, the walls of the, the room that we uh, we found the mosaic in. We also found, um, we haven't identified the source yet, but some really lovely and unusual um, bits of polished uh, marble, which would have added to that sense of uh, you know the sort of expensive nature of the decoration of that room something which we've we've not seen in any sites that I've I've worked on in terms of uh, or, or know about in in terms of our area so really interesting in that in terms of that level of decoration and what we might be able to do to reconstruct the room in the future but finally what we did find in the very top of the rubble um, of this um, room and very, I think, quite deliberately in the place in the centre of the apse, um, two um, human burials, these um, sort of almost um, in a crouch, not, yeah, in a crouch position, really, in a slightly fetal position, um, adjacent to one another. We don't really have much of an idea of what their date is yet, but I think there, there's a high likelihood they may be Anglo-Saxon. We, we, weight sort of radiocarbon dates very interested really in terms of that um you know final act of um deposition if you like in within this structure itself again the, the placement of these these um, people and their burials does suggest that there was some kind of indication of what this building was and we've got other evidence for that in rutland as well some of the um Roman remains that were excavated in uh, advance of Rutland water being created included another villa not too far away from where this one is and that one had uh, a number of burials associated with um, the remains of that, that that main villa building so it's clear that in the Anglo-Saxon period these buildings had some kind of uh, fascination some sort of magnetism that people wanted to come back to uh, and it might be that they are 
generations of people that were, um, you know, perhaps related in some way, quite distant way to people that occupied the, the, the villa in the Roman period. And so they knew what this was about. Um, but clearly there's some sort of association wanting to be made by um, people at this time. And so these uh, deposits have given us a really fantastic um, um, hope really of getting some really critical information about what was going on with these very important Roman sites as they went into decline and what happened to them afterwards. And we got more indication of that in the area of the annex where there was um, more indications of burial indications of um, animal bone deposits in the rubble layers overlying the building. And also this fantastic, um, pretty huge dog um, burial, which we, we expect to be the same date as the human burials. It's very much a sort of hunting dog size, really. Um, so we await radiocarbon dates for those with great excitement. Now, obviously, um, I'm sure many of you will have seen the, the great press um, that we got from this. I think it kind of took our breath away, really, what, what level of interest we got from this. And um, we expected it to be a big story, but I think the level of interest really kind of, um, uh, you know, it went over and, over and above our expectations, really. So, you know, it really shows the um, fantastic um, appeal that a discovery like this this can make and just going back to my theme on on stories really just to to wrap up um and and sort of just go through a little bit why why is this discovery so important well i think the story like i say it's a number of stories involved in this um project the the story of the the discovery and how that kind of developed is is an incredibly good example of, of good practice and, and, and how this kind of project can be really successful, um, you know, developing from something that really just kind of dropped out of the sky, really. And we have very much to um, thank Jim for his input there, his good sense to, to know when to stop, to contact the right people and to, to, to call in help when that was necessary. And he was brilliant to recognise that. And uh, and obviously that just kind of developed from, from that, those initial contacts really. And we've involved him and his family every step of the way. And he's actually taking part in the excavation. And you'll see from the Digging for Britain program, if any of you saw that, his level of involvement has been critical really in terms of, um, uh, of helping us, but also by keeping him and his family involved, it's, the right thing to do because it's clearly been a big upheaval in terms of what they can now do with the land and, and uh, the restrictions that are imposed on them because of the scheduling. Um, archaeologically speaking, this has been a fantastic discovery in terms of our understanding locally about what was going on in the Roman period at these fantastic villa sites. As I mentioned, this is a very significant discovery in terms of what we can now understand about um, the sort of upper tiers of Roman society, if you like, and, and how villas um, developed and what their um, role was in, in, in the local rural economy. But I think this one also has a great potential to inform on a national stage as well, because this is something that is so complete and, uh, and reasonably well um, survived and it offers a great um, opportunity to, to do some really good research excavation. As I said, we are going back with Historic England um, later this year to do a little bit more work to try and understand a bit more about the, those other buildings and, and, and complete that uh, um, story of, of how this site developed. And so we can tell a much fuller um, story of, 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 the, of this particular site. And then going back to the, um, the central story, if you like, the mosaic and the, and the travels of the Trojan War story, as I said, this is a story that's been with us for many, many, many years, um, thousands of years, in fact. And it, as I said, it was probably quite um, a developed story by the time Homer got to write it. Homer's version is widely seen as one of the very first um, exciting pieces of Western literature as we know it. And I mentioned Stephen Fry's version, that's the, the latest version. Um, I 
you know, it's it's something that's been told and retold. There were the different plays. There was different Roman versions, which were almost uh, like Quentin Tarantino versions of the um, the story, which cut very much to the violence and gore. And that was all they were interested in, as you would expect from the Romans, I suppose. Um, but clearly, this is a story that's developed and changed over time. And I'm sure that the people that came to view this at this fantastic um, villa complex would have taken their own versions of it away and the villa owner when he was telling the story may have emphasized certain pieces of the story depending on what his particular allegiances were or how he understood it um so this is really interesting to think about in terms of the sort of spread of the story and how these fantastic sort of uh, pieces of literature stay with us and why they're so important to our understanding of how things how things were in the past. It also gives an indication of the level of um, education in the past, what sort of sources might have been available to people. I mean, David Neal's um, idea is that this was um, sourced from an illuminated manuscript. He thinks that the level of colors that are involved and the way that the, the scenes are very dynamic and cartoon-like and, and perhaps the way that they kind of burst out of the borders is very similar to um, illuminated manuscripts that might have been available at the time. So that's another interesting sort of aspect that we really don't often get to think about. There's not a lot of evidence for that. And even though it's indirect, it leads us down some interesting ways of thinking about what might um, have um, been the inspiration for this and what, and you know, and how, how educated these people might have been. So this is about where we are with the project at the moment. Um, I hope you've enjoyed listening to, to to this summary of where we got to as i said we are going back to do some more work there will be more stories to tell and um, hopefully if you've enjoyed this i'd be very happy to come back and talk to you about the further work we do so thank you very much for listening and uh, i'm going to finish now thank you <laughs>